Good morning, everyone. Um, we are about to get started in our panel, and we're excited to have you all here. Great. Okay, so welcome. Um, it is, uh, I first want to start by thanking you all for braving um, this early morning platform, uh, me, mm, convening. Um, so thank you all so much. I am going to be the moderator for the panel today. My name is Olivia Mwiru. I am the founder of B Lab East Africa. I don't know how many of you have heard about B Lab or B Corps, just to get a sense of the people in the room. Okay, so roughly about half of the people. Um, so B Lab East Africa is a nonprofit that works around um, empowering for profit business owners to use the power of business to solve social and environmental challenges. Um, we are part of a global network um, of different B Lab offices. Uh, we have B Lab Europe, B Lab US, B Lab uh, Latin America, and in Australia, New Zealand, and in Asia. Um, and so I'm very happy to be here with you all today to discuss uh, on a topic that is something I'm becoming more and more passionate about as I get to learn about it. Um, as part of the B-Lab movement, one of the things that we're doing in East Africa is really trying to engage businesses on how can they be responsible businesses. Um, and these are more traditional business um, owners, so the people who have the brick and mortar stores, and um, getting to learn about new platforms that are trying to change how businesses work, that are moving the conversation out of being extractive to being more of a circular economy, is something that I think we will all find super engaging. Um, and as more people come in, we, we welcome you and we hope you enjoy the session. Uh, by sense of who's in the room, how many of you are uh, familiar with the concept of responsible platforms as it comes to peer-to-peer -to -peer, um, engagement? Great. Very few people. So panelists, you have your work cut out for you today. Um, by the end of this, we should at least have you um, have basic knowledge on what this platform means. We're not here to talk about predominantly Uber, Airbnb, which is what I thought this conversation was going to be about. Um, we are here to learn more about now what's the next phase. Um, how can we make these platforms actually work for people instead of being more capital driven? And so to set the mood for us today, we're going to have Alex um, give us a bit of history on where these platforms have come from and where hopefully they're going to go to create um, shared durable prosperity for everyone. So Alex, if you do not mind, you can take this stage and get us started. Okay. Merci, bah, bonjour, uh, bonjour à Thank tous. you. Uh, Good morning to all of you. As a matter of fact, the objective of uh, this uh, first session is to bring some information um, about digital platform, uh, platforms that should be more responsible than uh, they are today. Historically, I'm working for the Wisher network. I don't know whether we, you have ever heard of that network. It's a network that was developed a few years ago around the enthusiasm of the first cooperative platforms that were developed. We had the feeling that we were getting to the peer-to-peer -peer world. Uh, the peer-to-peer -peer platforms uh, were the first, uh, uh, the, the first beginnings, I would say, of, uh, uh, of uh, the web uh, interconnections in an economy, in a new economy. So we, as uh, Uber, Airbnb, uh, worldwide, we felt that uh, now we have the resources and means to do it. Now we will make it possible to help the other but then gradually we realized that those against this new economy were right as from the start and these large stakeholders were main or players were mainly uh, startups uh, from the Silicon uh, Valley funded by significant funds uh, asking for return on the investment and then gradually this new economy full of promises became uh, 
an economy where we are all capitalists wishing to get uh, uh, benefits and uh, profitability. So we were all people exchanging on platforms, trying to find customers on platforms rather than being peer-to-peer -peer in the initial philosophy. So we, uh, that is to say, people ch sharing experience and resources to develop a common project. So there were some players who could write in the right, uh, work in the right way. But, uh, uh, well, that's where we were a few years ago. So we wanted to know what the alternatives are, whether they already existed, whether they should uh, be further developed, or whether we should invent new things. And this was in connection with other movements. And then we had uh, various movements going to one uh, main objective. First of all, common, so-called common which uh, collectivity is, uh, something uh, like uh, Eri Nostrom that had the Nobel Prize of Economy. Uh, they wanted to see how in history we were able to share resources before being in the capitalist era. And uh, we realized that it was possible, and uh, sharing the resources didn't uh, endanger the resource as we thought, because we thought that every uh, homo economicus had to make profit and draw the advantages and deteriorate the resources of the others for our own profit. So it demonst she demonstrated that uh, it is possible to do something else. So this uh, so-called common movement uh, and uh, digital movements uh, have uh, got together, and uh, so now we have open source movement, peer-to-peer -peer movements. We started developing mo models of uh, online exchanges for a fairer um, sharing. And then we have the social economy. For about 100 years, we had players who did believe in associations, corporations, and uh, had already made uh, some experiments with the sharing of governance and value. And so this led to a very strong experience to develop sharing platforms that were economic platforms to try to find governments and business models that had already been tested in social economy. So how did we do that? There are several movements that uh, have arisen from that. Uh, first of all, the so-called co-platform, uh, two uh, U.S. Uh, uh, research workers uh, got together in a colloquium on a cooperative uh, uh, economy, and uh, they realized uh, that uh, uh, there were platforms that uh, were uh, bypassing uh, social laws. So they had a colloquium in uh, uh, New York about this, and uh, they started uh, working with all the players who wanted to develop open source platforms, <coughs> platforms that are based on on cooperative companies for the workers to uh, work on that, to be stakeholders in the governance of the platform and also to earn a salary. So uh, today, the rules of the game of the platforms are algorithms to which the leaders of the platform set objectives, and the workers depend on that. So in those platforms, alternative platforms, the workers or the employees can uh, choose the objectives of the algorithm and can determine the rules of the game on the platform. These platforms have a different relation with the user, for instance. Uh, today on the digital platforms, the data, your data do not belong to you. You have beautiful installations that have shown the length of the use of the platforms which you sign on. 
Uh, most uh, you uh, you provide uh, uh, data for a digital world uh, to keep these uh, properties of uh, or ownership of data, make sure that they are used for the common good, etc. So those uh, platforms, via the legal status of the cooperative company, since the data uh, belong to the platform and you are owner, a cooperative owner of the platform, you can take part in the decision making to see how this data will be used. So this co-platform movement, well, in three weeks we will have the fifth edition of that colloquium, draws funding now and attract alternative uh, uh, platforms. Fernando uh, is one of them, alternative to Amazon that was uh, set up uh, in uh, Germany. Fair BNB to compete with Airbnb, ownership to the local communities who decide to uh, put on the market uh, vacant spaces which they have to favor uh, the temporary tourist activities. Uh, we see that in Barcelona it has led to some problems, but uh, it may be also a very good things in some places. When you give the power to the community to see what they do, will do with the money that is generated, uh, to, then they should be able to manage the nuisances with tourists. Uh, this uh, could be quite good, and that's what Fair BNB tries to do. So this uh, co op movement is. Uh, uh, global. Uh, there is an association in France which is called the Coop des Communs, and uh, uh, it's a common platform that aims at being a link between the three parts of a social economy, uh, the uh, World Monde des Communs has uh, attracted research workers and tries to get resources to have uh, platforms that are developed by cooperative entrepreneurs, the, saying the only way to uh, have uh, technological ideas are not uh, automatically startups, and it's not the Silicon Valley which should be the, the only one to develop interesting projects. We could also have cooperative uh, uh, funding to have a platform which will, which will be only uh, a means to get to a sharing of resources by a community to fund the resources and to uh, maintain these resources. We are not a, uh, automatically obliged to uh, have a, a sort of a monopoly, a worldwide monopoly on uh, the, the, the the sector because multiple communities based on territories that have specific needs can be interconnected with the platforms they are developing to have an interconnection of needs and have a sufficient number of people to work on it to avoid having leaders on the market. So. We are now only at the beginning of this phenomenon. There are not many platforms like that yet. We have a COP cycle. Uh, we have MobiCorp, which uh, is also a cooperative uh, uh, of uh, Blablacar. We have uh, resources. We should. Uh, go into the governance they are uh, developing to become stakeholders. And it's an opportunity which we have had for some years in France. It's the legal status of SIC, a cooperative uh, com uh, company for um, uh, collective interest. Uh, you can have consumers of the platform who are cooperators. You can have the founders of the platform, cooperators. You can have the employees also. But you can also have uh, uh, public authorities, uh, uh, territorial communities, or the state that become cooperators in, on the platform. They put money into the capital, and then they can use the platform as customers. Well, it was not possible beforehand because the state always had to have various players in competition to choose. 
someone uh, to work with. So now we have tools that make it possible to develop uh, different platforms, and then the public authorities uh, should uh, help them uh, move forward, and it's up to the consumer to uh, go through to, to get to another platform because we're not totally sure that the uh, digital data should be owned. There are not many consumers who are aware of that. So we have to explain. We have uh, to develop the, uh, the mind of the people about uh, ethical platforms. Great. Thank you so much, Alex. Um, you have brought in some very interesting points there that I look forward for us to unpacking, especially the whole idea of stakeholders and what roles do they play um, and consumers and what, what role we can play also in how our information is being used in the platform. Um, and so for those of you who have joined us or who have been listening from the beginning, the reason why we had Alex start this off is Alex is a bit of a connoisseur when it comes to this space. Um, just to give you a bit of background on him. Um, Alex created the We Share community in Montreal, where he mainly explored the subjects of the platforms. And you've, you've heard that today, and his main focus was around their regulation, what is the impact of this platform on work, and the opportunity that they provide to reinvent collaboration through the platform co-op movement. Um, he is now back in France, and I think the whole of France should be thankful for that. Um, and he's now exploring the link between common goods and digital culture, uh, worked within the Mission Society Numérique, perfect, um, a department of the French Ministry of Economy and Finance. So thank you so much, Alex, for your insights on this. Um, now that we all have a general setting, a general idea of what these platforms are trying to do and the, and the shift that they're trying to create, um, we figured it would be a good point for us to dive into some of these platforms. Um, so we will start today um, with a presentation from Estefania. Um, Estefania is the co-founder and CEO of Place to Swap. She graduated from Este Business School and has an MBA in digital marketing and business. She has worked for 20 years. Um, she worked for 20 years in marketing, retail, and digital at Continent, L'Oreal, and Maison Le Jabi. Um, with her expertise in sustainability and brand strategy, she co-founded and runs Place to Swap the first customizable circular economy platform um, for brands, which aims to reduce the environmental impact of consumption. Um, so all of us, let's give a warm welcome to Estefania. Good morning to all of you, and thank you for being here for the third day. Well, after listening to Alex, it's difficult to take the floor. Well, anyhow, I am at the opposite uh, of all that because I've always worked in consumption and the large brands, and very early in my professional life, I felt that we were starting on overconsumption models that couldn't last much more. So after, at a certain time in my career, I felt, OK, let us stop. What can I do for these brands? I really like brands, value creation, beautiful things, strategy. But what can we do to avoid having this based on overproduction, overconsumption? Now we are fed up with all that. So. Can, what can we do for those brands who have beautiful things to propose to uh, realize what the real values are and come back to the grassroots? So next to that, well, I'm a consumer of uh, uh, cooperative uh, economy as from the, the start, or Airbnb, etc. I have uh, rented things for a long time. and. Uh, so, with my knowledge in retail and the brands, I wondered what I could do for all these brands that are concurrent with uh, what we have uh, heard to start doing some, something new and having a new approach. And we will see that consumers expect that very much. What was a great change from the very beginning of my professional life is that consumers are now 
reacting and acting through these platforms. They say that they feel like consuming differently because life is expensive, because the planet is getting destroyed, because we are fed up with this life in an over-consuming society. 70% of the millennials say that if uh, the brands do not get responsible, we will uh, leave them. So they should develop new values that are more responsible. I am sure that all of you in the room know what the cooperative uh, platforms are, like Vinted, for instance, uh, two-thirds of the French now uh, buy uh, second hand. It's a phenomenon that has totally changed uh, the, the life of the brands. Uh, three years ago, when we went to a brand, they were saying, what are you talking about? Why do you want us to start selling uh, second hands. Uh, three years ago, nobody knew uh, vintage. So in the meantime, there was not only um, the clothes, there were also sweets and things like that. So now we uh, wondered what we could do. If uh, we do that globally, the United States, which is a very mature market, in that new world of consumption, renting, etc., these are uh, huge markets that have uh, an impact on the uh, brand's uh, business. So what did we do? We decided to develop a technology to support these brands in a new development of a more uh, wealthy and more sustainable model to make it possible for brand consumers. It's as if we had a vintage of, uh, for the brands, for not only fashion, but all the brands that are likely to be uh, uh, rented or sold, or like uh, uh, do-it-yourself, toys, books, etc. So we have a platform that uh, will be on the site of the brands and the consumers of the brand will sell and uh, buy uh, second-hand products with uh, hyper-fluid, hyper-qualitative uh, um, flow. And uh, the brands will sell the products they haven't sold. Today, there is a new law that has been enacted to forbid uh, rebates. Uh, uh, up to now, the uh, selling channel are uh, low price. Uh, then, uh, uh, you have a whole chain of second-hand products, which is very long, and we don't know what happens with the products, but at the end of the day, they are not recycled, they are burnt, and uh, so as from tomorrow, it will be forbidden. So now we will have to be aware that the products have to be consumed, have to be recycled, and shouldn't be destroyed. So our platform makes that possible. So on the longer term, it will be rent, uh, returns, and recycling. So the brands will, uh, will take care of the end of life of products. Economy is not based in production and sale of new products, but a mixed model where they will uh, uh, ensure the end of life of uh, the product for these products to be a more sustainable business model for other consumers to have an access to the brand. So today what happens is that more and more uh, everything is uh, more expensive. There are more and more things to consume. People do not have enough money, so the brands should be aware of that too. The circular economy will open an access to the people who today nev do not have access to better products, uh, more expensive products. Today, I think it's very important that consumers uh, 
uh, realized that there should be more consumers having access uh, um, to products that are more sustainable rather than buy products which are cheaper and uh, are destroyed after a while. So this is the DNA of our project, uh, give a new value to things and uh, help the brands be the new players in that change <clears throat> to lead to uh, more wealthy and sustainable business models, also more equitable products, uh, projects, so, or models, rather. Uh, so, we are two uh, co-founders. Uh, uh, in sustainability and uh, digital, and uh, we have also an expert uh, in all these uh, types of platforms. And our first customers are Camaius. I don't know whether you've seen uh, on uh, the news that Camaius uh, uh, was there, La, uh, Galerie Lafayette, Bricorama, Histoire d'Or. Uh, so these are the brands which we already have in our business pipeline. I have a very positive mission, I think, because uh, these are changes that take time, that are heavy to manage. And what we've seen is that the brands are aware that we should change. And we don't see them as fast fashion or others, all brands in all uh, fields. It, there is a will to change things. It won't happen overnight, but uh, it's good that there are also other models on the market, but, uh, they, but all together we should uh, consume better, consume less, because we will consume products of a higher quality that last longer. So, well, I remember maybe I'm already old, I don't know. But, uh, uh, when I talk with my grandparents and my parents, uh, they were talking about a way to consume that was much more healthy. Well, uh, we were repairing things. We had people uh, we were suing on uh, what we were uh, doing. We didn't. We, we had things repaired rather than uh, thrown to the garbage. So come back uh, to a way to consume that is more logical, wealthy, uh, sorry, healthier, uh, to in, and do that with all the brands which today are responsible for uh, overconsumption. And up to now, we have been happy with overconsumption. But, uh, well, we didn't know it was bad. Same thing as uh, smoking. Uh, we were smoking because we were not aware that it was bad to uh, smoke. Same thing with consuming. Uh, so we all have to react, both consumers and the brands. All the entrepreneurs uh, have a savoir-faire, a knowledge, a technical know-how. So we should use all the resources uh, to uh, change the ecosystem and have all consumers follow us. The system has to change. That's it. Thank you so much, Estefania. And um, like you, I remember the days where we would sew things and get our shoes fixed and get everything done. So I don't think that's an old. <laughs> We're not old. We're not old. We just we, we know responsible consumption. Um, so switching a bit from um, Estefania's presentation to that of Clermont. Clermont is the founder of uh, the social business Share and Smile, um, whose purpose is to stimulate social bonds and solidarity between people. Um, after 18 months of entrepreneurship and multi-activity, Clermont left his job at Decathlon in April 2019 in order to make sports accessible to many. Um, and he, he meant it for real, for real. So his, his quote is, make, it, make sports accessible to many people, dot, 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 but for real. <laughs> um, so with his free sport equipment sharing platform, Sheathlon, he hopes to do this. Uh, so, Clément, why don't you take the stage and tell us your story? Okay. <coughs> Bonjour tout le monde. 
Good morning, everyone. So my name is Clément, and I'm so happy to see you here. I have no slideshow, so I like to tell stories. And we talk about uh, Sleeping Beauty, local beer, and my uh, partner's bottom. Botox. It's true. But before that, we're going to take 30 seconds and imagine that a gift that you can hold in your hand. And this gift is quite nice, actually, because inside there is something that will help you connect to yourself, connect to others, and to the planet. And we could shake it. You hear nothing. You don't know what it is. It's lightweight. You cannot buy it from Amazon. I'm going to tell you at the end what this is, unless you've guessed what it is. So let us start with the story. We all have in mind the story of Sleeping Beauty, deeply asleep for 100 years and waken up by the prince. Well, not only princesses can sleep so much, it's also Bikes, bicycles. Do you have an idea how much time a bicycle sleeps in its life cycle in percentage? No idea. 90, who says more than that? Going, going, 99, 99.986, only one hour a year. So bicycles, all the sports equipment, are sleeping assets that get damaged because they're not used. And you can die from sleeping too much, and then it's worthless. And it's not only princesses and bicycles sleep, but also our social link. Uh, loneliness in France is a major concern for 80% of us. And even more serious than that, one French person out of eight is in a situation of social death. And these are the most vulnerable to all small accidents in life. And by sleeping too long, you can die from it. So we are in deep shit, aren't we? But thank God, uh, princesses woke up, and the Finland, Norway, and Denmark represent the countries with the best national uh, happiness in, uh, index. And at nursery school, they teach Alors, them empathy. France, so at Sheraton, for us, is to wake up the social link by pooling the sports equipment. Each free uh, loan between private individuals is a, a pretext to provoke meetings that are worth of interest rather than interested. I give you an example. is the story of Marianne Alex. Marianne has a trailer that she uh, she's put on the platform that Alice uh, loaned it. And then at the right time, Alice got a clean trailer and a good bottle of local beer. But the best in this is that Alex and Mariam, who didn't know each other, actually met each other. And they're now united by the holy links of wedlock. Well, we wake up uh, the uh, social link. And now the spark that started is Aurélie. My partner, she wanted to cycle with me, but she didn't have one. And she said, why don't you buy one? She said, 200 euros is a lot to have so Botox and not knowing whether I will cycle tomorrow. So Aurélie is happy now. She can cycle when she wants. She just uh, borrows paddle and badminton rackets. And we borrowed a tent, a backpack, and a uh, headlamp. We don't need to invest anymore to practice sports. And this is also what Sheraton is all about, is that wake up the sports equipment for social link and the practice for public health. And not only Morelli, Mariano, Alex use Sheraton, you also have employers like Decathlon or M Comme Mutuelle who decide to community, sharing communities for their people to reinforce uh, cohesion. So I think that we are experiencing a change, the end of one world, not the end of the world. So we are leaving linearity and abundance, which has reached its limits now, to get to a circular economy 
of frugality and sharing. And this is a great opportunity to uh, live better together while taking care of the planet. And the cherry on the cake is that by pooling, we uh, limit the impact on this planet. We use better what is there rather than producing on a different continent some new things that don't serve for nothing. And the liquor in the cherry on the cake is that with less time, we have more link. So you may have understood that in our version of the story, there's just, just one Prince Charming. Each of you can be the hero who is going to uh, wake up the local uh, Sleeping Beauty. You have to um, um, embrace and kiss uh, the, uh, this kind of economy. It's just Chatelon is only like a horse of the Prince Charming. And when we transport millions of people to wake up millions of Sleeping Beauties and live happily ever after, ever after with a lot of link and fewer assets. So thank you. I took the example of uh, the box and the gift and uh, do it in more interactive format. So I realized that we cannot actually uh, give you all the microphones. So I'm going to reveal it straight away. The gift is just your capacity to be generous. And it happens that uh, in Go Imperium, we can change the world. You have the power to change the world by being generous. And it's great is that you are doing yourself good than to the others. So it may be a bit stating the obvious, but it does work. So I will invite you through Sheraton by loaning what you own, because if you raise your hand, if you have uh, sports equipment, if you ask you who is using every day your sports equipment, it would be less people. So don't hesitate to share your comfort. There are other ways than Sheraton. But you can really change the world by just doing this. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Clemo. Um, if your app was in Kenya, I would definitely share my sports equipment. Um, so, yeah, when you get there, let me know. Um, and last but not definitely the list, um, we have looked at brands, we've looked at um, sporting equipment. Now we're going back to uh, communities. And to walk us through what he has created, Emiliano, who is the CEO and co-founder of Rootopia, will present to us about the work Rootopia is doing. Um, by way of introduction, Rootopia is a social enterprise that enables rural communities uh, to generate a sustainable income through biocultural tourism. And this is without the need of external tour operators or intermediaries. Uh, Drutopia has been awarded the WEGE Prize 2018 for its circular economy model and just recently um, was awarded the HALT Prize 2019, which is the largest global competition of social entrepreneurship in the world. Um, Emiliano is also a big fan of climbing and freediving and of basically everything that involves being outside in the wild. So I'm so sorry you're inside today, but if we go through this quickly, you can go outside. <laughs> Thanks, Olivia. I think I'm going to be the first one to use it in Mexico. Sure, Aslan. Uh, thank you very much. Yes, so I would like to start explaining um, Rutopia by sharing you the story of two people. So I would like to introduce you with Leticia and Alejandra. And they are two indigenous mixed tech women. They live in a very, very small community in the mountains of Oaxaca, which is a state in Mexico. Now, their community for many decades has been making uh, an income by making charcoal out of the forests that they have inside their territory. And about 10 years ago, these resources were almost depleted and all the men in the community had to migrate to the United States. So it's a community that is now mostly populated by women and children. Now, the women there thought it was time to create a sustainable economy by that doesn't harm the nature resources they still have, or their traditions. So they formed a group that is called Millenary Women, and they decided that they're gonna plant agave plants that restore the soil, and it's, by the way, also the plants that make, from which you make tequila, and, and also by receiving travelers in their community. And they launched this project. It came the day that they were going to open it to the public. They put a little like signs in the nearby highways to invite people to come. And when I met them, 
it had been three years since they, they had launched this project and they hadn't received not even one traveler by that point. The agave plants were doing good, they were growing, but they hadn't received not even one traveler. And the critical thing here is that this is not an isolated rare case. It is just one of at least 2,000 indigenous communities in Mexico that are trying to receive travelers as a way of developing in a sustainable way, but that are not being able to do it just because they don't have access to the same tools that we all have. Uh, in Mexico, there's more than 38 million travelers that come each year looking for authentic experiences. And these experiences could be provided by more than 5.4 million young indigenous people that are unemployed. And most travelers looking for nature in Mexico end up in places like this, in tourist traps, because the tourism in Mexico is very centralized in very few hotspots that are already having very negative impacts in the environment around them. And most indigenous people in Mexico end up doing jobs like this one. They have to migrate to these hotspots or to the big cities in Mexico. So what is the problem here? Well, the truth is that all these communities have the nature, the culture, the local talent, and even the infrastructure to have very successful touristic projects. And they have even received funding from the government and from international NGOs to develop very nice ecotouristic projects. But the truth is, this is not enough. Because you also have to sell. You also have to reach the market. And for this, you need easy bookings. You need a good customer service. And you need to be resilient to late payments. Because the truth is that most of the tools you have to sell are going to either pay you just in time or are going to pay you after the trip is finished. So you have to have an economic resiliency to be able to cover the costs before getting paid and also with the risk of the travelers never arriving. And this is very hard for little communities that don't have a very high flux of, um, of money. And this is the reason why three-fourths of all the, these kind of initiatives are currently failing in Mexico and in many countries in Latin America. So this represents a market opportunity of around $45 billion in one of the fastest growing markets in the, in the world, which is the experiential travel market. And that's why we created Rutopia. And Rutopia is a platform that enables these indigenous touristic initiatives to design and sell trips online while making it easy for travelers to find and live these amazing and wild experiences. So how do we do it? The first part is we do something we call Ruto Hubs, which is working groups, uh, usually as a form of a local cooperative that have different roles within the community. Now, the reason why we do it in indigenous communities as well is because they already have a communal decision-taking um, framework in which they already have different committees in which the income and the, um, the whole project is generated for the whole community and not for individuals, and that is in the very DNA of Rutopia as well. Now with this, we do co-creation workshops in which we have experiences that are unique, that are safe, and that are all-inclusive. And when these kind of experiences are ready, then we take charge of selling them. And we do it through many different channels. Um, doing this, it's key for the success of any touristic initiative, but the reason is the uh, the problem is, it is not easy. It is not easy to do this because for it, you need reservation software, you need to have customer service, you have to have payment facilities, and all this has very high fixed costs, which are unbearable for small touristic initiatives. So what we do is we allow them to share these fixed costs and we turn it into a variable fee that we charge directly to the traveler with each trip. And these communities only need to have a cell phone with normal reception, no high-speed internet to use these services. And through us, they can position themselves in platforms such as Airbnb, TripAdvisor, Expedia, and different online travel operators. Uh, our business model is that we currently charge a 20% commission directly to the traveler on top of the price established by the local communities. And by just having traveler, 20 travelers a month, most of these communities can have an income that is 
at least the double of the traditional extractive economies they have currently in their communities. And I have a very short video here just to, so you can have an idea of how um, a rootopia actually looks like. So that's just a little taste of Rutopia, so you all get excited to come to Mexico soon. And yeah, so currently we're working with 12 indigenous communities in Mexico. We are directly working with 140 people in these communities. And our goal for the next year is to actually reach 252 communities. We have an alliance with the Mexican government, so we're gonna do it through them because as I said before, there has been already investment deployed to have the infrastructure, like rural infrastructure in these communities that is currently abandoned. So it's also a way of bringing back all this value that it's already on these uh, rural places and activate a little bit the economy there. Our long-term shot is to work in many different countries in Latin America. Uh, two months ago, we opened our first community in Colombia. So we are also very excited about that. And our model, in the, in the long term or in the medium term, it's to actually have a platform cooperative. And I'm sure Alex will be able to give us very good input on this as an expert on that. But our, our goal is that we are aware that we need some private um, investing, it's very likely, but we want most of the platform to be owned by the communities that are more engaged. So our ideal way of working would be to be a cooperative of smaller cooperatives. And we are very excited right now because just uh, a couple of months ago, as Olivia was saying, we actually got the investment to build the platform and to expand to Latin America from the Holt Price Foundation. And also we realized that to reach these goals, we would have to partner up with the global leaders in experiential travel. So just two months ago, we closed a deal with Airbnb in which they will actually drop the commission they have. So working through us with these indigenous communities, they could have these communities can have access to their platform, which, which is a good tool, but without having to pay any commission, so it's completely collaborative. And that's our shot with other platforms as well. And yes, so I would just like to end by saying that the, the real impact on this is that when a community is gaining an economic income and recognition for keeping their nature and their cultural life there is a revalorization of the resources. And eventually, this leads to a reinvestment to protect them. And then there is a regeneration of the ecosystems and the local social tissues. And that is the true impact of what we do. And we believe the question today is not if this kind of travel is possible or not, because we know that the market need is there. We know that also that the communities are ready. And we know that we have the tools in the world to make this tourism happen. So the question today really is, um, yeah, who wants to come to Mexico <laughs> right now, right? <laughs> I think most of us want to come to Mexico. <laughs> so, um, gosh, thank you so much, uh, my panelists. You guys have been great. Um, so I'll ask them a couple of questions, like two or three, and then we can open it up to the audience. I, you know, Alex, you started so well with setting out the purpose. And from listening to all of you, the common thread that I'm hearing is the platforms are creating a way in which you can change how the system works. 
um, a system which has been incentivized and rewarded for extractive nature um, to one that is um, to a new system where we're really looking at sharing, um, uh, sharing of knowledge, sharing of goods, sharing of services, um, kind of giving a second home to equipments that are not being used to clothes that um, would get some, some love from someone else instead of being burnt up. Um, and this can be both monetary or non-monetary. Um, and so there is like a lot of opportunities that when you think about this um, space uh, comes out of um, the conversations that we've had today. And the minute you start talking about opportunities, what creeps up is growth. For this space to grow, should it scale or should it not scale? And so this question I want to ask to um, Estefania. Um, you, you've shown um, amazing statistics of the $7 billion is the market share in yeah. France. So scale would be what we would hope for? I think so. I think that the, and 7 million is nothing. I mean, you know, compared to the whole consumption, it's absolutely nothing. Uh, it's not a question of scale. Uh, I think that brands, uh, because I'm, I'm in brands uh, ecosystem, uh, brands need uh, to take the responsibility and to, to build uh, a mixed, I mean, I'm speaking English, it vaut mieux peut-être que je parle français, désolé. Maybe it's better if I speak French, but roughly the objective and the purpose is that the brands realize and take it on board and go for it. It's not transforming brands. The brands should transform their business into a second-hand business. Or they just have to continue creating value, but not only a value based on overproduction and overconsumption. It's continuing to produce producing, creating value on a model that is fairer, more healthy, and more sustainable. And of course, it's not scaling up, but rather that the whole universe of consumption realize that, and the whole universe of consumption uh, look into the end of life of their products and take care of it. Great. Um, I love that answer. So it's about how do we change companies and how they're thinking about production rather than how do we scale this platform so that they can be the answer to whatever questions that we're having. Um, Alex, we had a debate about this yesterday and you had raised some very interesting points. So I'd, I'd love to hear from you also. What do you think about um, the future for this space as it relates to its opportunity to grow? Um. In terms of growth, as I said earlier, I think that the main idea is that this platform, they don't want to grow strongly in the image we have of uh, the unicorns that should have a continental or intercontinental size to go to critical mass and to reinvest and so on and so forth, but it's the behavior. It's the behavior that should grow and scale up. And the platforms are only or should only be the common assets, uh, shared assets for communities to share and needs to have access to that sharing. And for that, the end of the presentation of Emiliano was great, it was interesting in the idea that communities are ready. We have communities that have that requirement that need a tool. And what we're talking about here is a better capacity of access to these tools. So yes. It is still expensive to set up a platform, both in terms of development, to have a user experience that is interesting, and then in marketing, to impose yourself. It requires a lot of money. So you need an enormous growth to make it profitable. But if you put yourself in a paradigm of cooperative platform when we have an interconnection of a lot of smaller platforms, then you don't need that growth. The only growth we need is behavior, the sharing behavior, the reflex of building a platform to share our resources, and maybe maybe players who can make available some resources so it's easier to do it. So we can think of open source, because in technology, the open source technology allows us to go and get things that already exist and reassemble them. But even that costs uh, some money, because you need to pay the developers who use it. But we could also think about the uh, public uh, sector 
public players could see these platforms as an infrastructure. Today, an infrastructure is a bridge, a road, or a school. Maybe you can have bricks of technical infrastructure that could be public, used by communities uh, that need it. So these are reflections that are underway, actually in the, the states and the various local governments. What is the place of the government in the services they can provide to citizens? But it's not there yet, but we could get there. So that scaling up could go through a sharing, a pooling of technical resources, maybe through a public player. It's a debate. Uh, this, the, the commons is sometimes a, a non-state vision where peer-to-peer -peer they want to have an intermediary, and the state is by nature. So these are things that should be debated. I don't know whether you wanted to, to agree with that, but the world of uh, corporate, uh, we have to see that uh, beyond the brands. But I think the corporate world could do a lot of things because you cannot only rely on the state for everything. I think that the corporate world should be more generous and more social oriented and more uh, fairer. So it's not, the, we heard that several times, the communities are ready, the people are ready to share, people are ready to exchange and they're happy to do it. As soon as we have a platform, the people go all for it because they're so happy. They're happy because they have a new way of doing things, they like it, and they uh, we have the feeling they contribute to something positive. So uh, the community is already, the technology is not that complicated to build. So if the corporate world in general uh, take it on board and give a bit of their money, because that's what we're talking about, I think that it would, uh, it would be great. That's what I think we should, uh, this is the kind of change we'd like to provoke. Yeah, and I, I love that provocation. So. Sticking to the idea of the corporates and um, the role that uh, traditional businesses can play into this. So how do we integrate those players? Um, Emiliano and um, Clement, I know you, you're both working with um, Clement for Decathlon and Emiliano with Airbnb, as you've mentioned. Um, so it'll be great to hear from both of you what your experience has been in terms of engaging with, co with corporates. Are they receptive to this idea or does it take a lot of um, convincing? It's not an easy question. Decathlon, especially, is a creature that is uh, had no heads or no decision maker or thousands. You don't have one decision maker that say we'll do this or this that. Everyone decides locally on their uh, scope what is good to do or not. This means that having a deal with the Decathlon world or the Decathlon France is particularly uh, complicated. So I started internally at the Cathlon, this idea of Sherathlon. I was working for them, for Between, the cycle brand. And internally as well, it's not easy to have something that is disruptive, that is completely different from the operating mode. They are used to, even though the fact it was, it was completely in the Cathlon's vision, which was making the sport practice accessible to the many. Now, they've added uh, sustainably. So it is not an easy question, but uh, there were loads of supporters, a lot of people that wanted this to happen, and therefore we ended up finding the right person who said, I engage France on this topic. So it's great. And honestly, without the support of the Cathon, we wouldn't be here. We wouldn't, we wouldn't be uh, where we are now. We wouldn't have the resources because it's the first client who put on the table and say, we trust you. We pay a, a, a ticket as a customer. So they open the doors and then the other, the relationship with the other economic actors are much easier. So it is a support that is definitely significant. But it's not easy because we come with something that is very different to what they used. So you have to find how, what 
what is in for them. And we'll probably talk about that later, but uh, what seems important is how do you take them to exploring new ways of doing things that will serve their interests, serve their core purpose, their raison d'être, without putting them into too much danger. The idea of sharing equipment, whether it's sports equipment or tools or books, is not to kill all the economic actors that produce new products, but rather to help them to be aware that they can continue playing a role in accessibility to products and users in a different way than by uh, selling new products, by rebalancing their mix, if you wish. So my dream would be that you could help all these players so that uh, shopping centers wouldn't but be there to push uh, goods, but to help repair, replace, uh, reuse, and so on. That's it, I'll stop here. Yes, so in our case, the, as you said, our approach, our closest approach has been with Airbnb. And I think in general, when you're trying to make alliances with uh, corporations like Airbnb that are for profit and actually they just went public, so they have a lot of stakeholders to, they have to respond to. I think the important thing is to show them and to prove them that by doing things right and by doing the things in a responsible way, it's also good for their business and it's also good for the long-term sustainability of their business. And I think that's the approach we have taken with them and that we're talking about because they know that if they want to stay, to, uh, stay in Mexico, they will have to uh, you know, deal with the problems that we all know Airbnb has, like gentrification and different social issues that it's causing in major cities. And if they want to go into the rural areas in Mexico, they would have to do it in the right way. And I think that's why they're also very interested in working with us because we are changing a little bit their mind of, instead of working and giving power to individuals, what they do through Utopia is that they're giving power to collectives. And this is a huge mitigator of conflict because at the moment you are empowering a whole community, the probability that that destination is gonna be sustainable in many different ways in the long term increases a lot. So. So I think that's the key, it's just like aligning the, the interest and also understanding what is that they want. Um, anyone else with any other thoughts to add to that? Um, I, and I do relate to that. Uh, as we worked on growing the B Corp community in all the markets, it always takes a lot of convincing, especially for, for publicly traded companies, to really get them to think about a new idea, new initiative, and it always helps to have a champion within the organization who gets what it is you're about. Um, so I'm about to open it up to the audience, but my final question um, is picking up on Alex and, and Estefania's earlier debate around regulation. So do we depend on the government for a lot of things? And one of the questions that I ask, because I'm from Kenya and for us, government is everything. They, they see all, they do all. Um, who should regulate this space? Should it be regulated? I think we shouldn't regulate the way we act. We should provide a legal framework which is required for all these platforms to work in the right way. I don't really believe in regulation. I rather think we should have a fair functioning based on rules with no legal uh, void that uh, makes it possible to have a wrong use of the platforms. Um. Well, I would say we should regulate at least a little, but of course to avoid the legal void. Well, there are players, regional or uh, le uh, players, also Europe, European authorities, which started to do something, namely on the relations between uh, the suppliers working on the platforms and uh, uh, the platforms uh, to avoid having things like uh, Amazon coming to sell on Amazon and who could be withdrawn. Uh, 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 the uh, research just because uh, uh, they were getting a penalty 
you have some players that uh, all totally depend on Amazon, uh, France, uh, uh, Europe. Uh, well, you have the legal uh, power which now recognize that uh, the um, people delivering goods on bicycles uh, should be protected by rules in California. The same thing, Uber uh, drivers have become employees of the company, so we see that there is an influence of legislation on the way the platforms are working. Now, it works or not, but uh, uh, as in any uh, thing like that, the large economic players have more power than the communities that do not automatically have. Uh, last year, we had a conference on cooperative uh, platforms in France. Benjamin Coria, uh, who, is, who knows uh, very well the economics, uh, said that in the 70 years, there had been a problem similar to Uber and uh, the uh, labor law with uh, uh, milk producers. Milk producers were so much uh, submitted to constraints by the uh, retailers that they had asked to have new working agreements. Uh, so now we have a legislation that developed charters. Uh, now the um, uh, the uh, retailers uh, have uh, to follow some rules about the relations uh, with them. Uh, and uh, uh, so I draw your attention to what is now uh, being included in Article 20 in the new law on the various forms of mobility in France, where there is now uh, uh, um, uh, part uh, on uh, the uh, the, the fact that you can't change a working uh, agreement or, uh, when uh, uh, you uh, have new conditions that appear regarding, for instance, the delivery on uh, bicycles. So now we have uh, frameworks uh, to provide alternative uh, uh, rules uh, because this protects uh, the employers because uh, when you are paid 47 euros a day and you have no insurance in case of an accident is not enough when you have a family, when you have children, etc. So uh, uh, there are, should be now cooperative companies that provide you with a, a framework. Uh, and uh, of course, we hope that uh, that framework will be uh, well used. Um, well, there are things that happen which are not well known. But for instance, for uh, bicycle delivery platforms, the relation is a relation of subordination. So sometimes it becomes a, a labor a work agreement. But uh, when you take uh, the, uh, uh, the when you, you see what's the salary uh, of those guys is, uh, you see that it's under the minimum uh, uh, salary. There are some people who have understood that there are people who cannot work the refugees because they can't be entrepreneurs, the refugees. So uh, they uh, uh, take the application and they uh, ask the refugees to work for them. So you have a job and they are paid half the price when they pay them. So you have uh, uh, invisible uh, layers of people. You have uh, very, very bad things which are being done. Uh, an equipment uh, uh, or a fashion company says it's not my fault if my subcontractor uh, employs uh, very young people for the manufacturing. It's not my fault. Well, uh, regulations should exist. There should be some pressure from consumers saying we demand transparency. We want to make sure that uh, you do not uh, have uh, young people or refugees work for you. I don't know how to do it, but I think it's necessary to do something. We have to be aware of that. And we have all a responsibility of demanding a regulation in this matter. Now, with regard to the uh, work of the platforms, 
there is also something like the organization of the workers. The platforms draw uh, advantage of having self-employees working for them. Do you have uh, groups on Facebook? You have a uh, collective associations that are starting uh, legal. Uh, actions, introducing legal actions, uh, uh, trade union actions. So the work of uh, the work uh, by the workers on the platforms, that's something that is now being uh, tackled. <clears throat> it may go through the cooperatives, uh, employment, unemployment and activity. Well, thank you so much. I could continue asking you guys questions forever and ever, um, but I do want to turn to the audience. So um, anyone who has any burning questions for the panel, this is your ch Oh, right there. <laughs> um, Thank you. Good morning to all of you, and thank you for your presentations. A question for Clément. Can you come back to the economic uh, uh, model? And Stefania, are you working on the uh, high-end industry? Are you uh, working with luxe? And how about the products that have not been sold? How can you... Um, embark on that. Well, the economic model. Well, at Atlant, at Cher Atlant, it's part of our business. We have the platforms and uh, social engineering advice how to uh, people. On the platform, we have uh, two sources of revenues. The first one is we propose organizations that uh, can be companies who uh, do things for their employees. It may be associations, uh, a social uh, organization, whatever. Uh, 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 maybe a representative of uh, 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 a district in the city. Uh, uh, well, it's a sort of a VIP part in uh, in a night uh, club. Uh, it's we have. Uh, uh, the possibility of uh, uh, sharing publicly and uh, sharing privately. So this works well because we have a human value for that organization, a uh, uh, sense of belonging, cohesion, etc. And uh, depending on the question, it can boost the employer's brand or bring an added value for the inhabitants of a district, for instance. And uh, that's the first model. Second model, and it's interesting in the light of cooperation with uh, the enterprises and uh, the classical model. Uh, in uh, retailing, we have a problem. It's the number of uh, customers. People do not go to the stores. They go to the stores. Uh, um, uh, they ask something uh, for loan, and you have people who will not come back. They come to uh, buy. They come to bring it back. They come twice, and uh, it makes it possible to have a link uh, and to know better who the customers are, why they buy, why they don't buy, etc. So, and this is uh, good. We start working with Decathlon. We have uh, started that uh, recently, and it's a very good way to have a reconnection with uh, uh, the catchment er area, with uh, the customers. And it's less expensive also to do that. And uh, I think that this is part of uh, a new model, they want to change their role and become useful socially, locally, and beyond the social aspect uh, have also an impact on the planet. It's interesting to see that by doing that, you can start uh, thinking about what else can be done in the store. 
It's quite interesting to see uh, how the discussions may lead to things which are unexpected. Uh, yes, we do approach luxury brands. The brands are the first uh, ones uh, impacted. Uh, luxury is not accessible to all, so uh, they are very much desired. And uh, up to now, uh, uh, it was something which uh, was not totally accepted. But now, things have uh, changed. We build a way to get to it. Uh, the unsold products, uh, well, up to now, the uh, products which are, uh, have not been sold is a matter of image. The image is very, is very important, is essential for uh, the brands. Uh, well, uh, they had private uh, sales, uh, and then they were uh, burning out the uh, products. Now we recover those products, and we have new marketing strategies to uh, give uh, value to those products and sell them differently. So, actually, the marketing of the end of life of a product is not the same as the marketing of new products. These are two different strategies that they have to coexist and be consistent for the image of the brand. So that's to create value and strengthen the image of the brand. But anyhow, what is clear today is that if tomorrow this behavior, this uh, responsible dimension is uh, not taken into account by the brands, it will be to the detriment of their image. So we have to find a solution anyhow. Because uh, if they are not responsible, they will not make it. It's important to promote the values in that way. Good morning. I'm Claire Henri Merillo, and I try to uh, introduce myself as someone who wants to work for the common interest. As Alexander was saying, the rapprochement between the state, the public, and the, com the communities. Of course, here we talk about common good. Uh, I would say there are many common goods. We are local player. We produce common products at a very small scale, and we realize what the difficulty is. Well, within that framework, we organize an event, a, a totally different scale. It's called the Rumix on the 6th and 7th of December. It will question the uh, communities. It will be in Villeneuve d'Ascq. We ask the question, what will happen if we bring together the communities and the public authorities? In the European community of Lille, we are working with uh, uh, other players uh, um, for them to be ready on the 5th and 6th of December to uh, try to have a rapprochement between communities and public actions. I think that, as a matter of fact, it is something that will have to be tackled uh, with all the usual precautions to be taken. Okay, thank you for, for the observation. I think we, we all agree. <laughs> okay, any other question for the panel? Um, thank you for your presentation. So my question is for Emilio. Um, one is, how are you going to map all the community in, America, in South America? And my second question is, you're not scared that it's going to completely change the way of living of the community? And like, 
is everything is going to be done for the tourists in the community? And my third question is, who is your tourist target? Is it more international or is it more local people in Mexico who want kind of to get back to their roots and understand also like the way of living in the people in rural area? Great, thanks for the questions. Um, yeah, can you remind me the first one, please? How are you going to map all the communities in South America? Yes, thanks. So, so far our strategy for mapping the communities, it's through governments and local NGOs. Uh, just to give an example, in Mexico there has been 2,700 touristic initiatives that have been funded by Mexican government, but also NGOs such as the Nature Conservancy Fund and other conservation NGOs. So they already have all this inventory of communities that have the infrastructure, are, are ready to offer these services, but they are just not being able to connect with the market because of the barriers we talked about before. So that model in Mexico, and it's very similar that we know in Colombia and in Ecuador. So I think it's gonna be a similar strategy for expanding into different countries. Now the second question, and I think that's a very important one. And before answering, how are we gonna manage to mitigate the impact, it's important to see that the communities that we work with are communities that are already undergoing an extractive economy. Are indigenous communities that are developing, that are aiming for a better quality of life, and the way they do it now is through cattle breeding or, for example, palm oil plantation. And the, what we are managing with our model is kind of like a payment for environmental services, but it, that is sustainable in an economic way in the long term. So our thesis is that it's going to be regenerative in the long term because in order for you to have small groups of travelers, you have to have some kind of conservation of the culture and the nature that you, that you own within your community. And to mitigate the risks, we are always aiming for quality over quantity. So if one destination starts to get a uh, very high demand, for example, what we're gonna do is we're gonna trans, uh, start a transition into more premium experiences that keep the small volume and low impact, but with a growing um, benefits for the whole community. So that's our approach for that. And the market, so far it's been like 70% uh, Mexican market, which is very, it's very happy for us because our impact is also trying to break the gap that exists in Mexico between the populations in the urban areas and the people in the rural areas. And it's also a way of having some kind of sensibilization for all the young people that are, in many cases, like it's very common, for example, in Mexico City, that a lot of people have come to Europe, but they have never been in an indigenous community in Mexico. And we're trying to break that gap. Bonjour, euh, Yannick Ponce pour euh, Yannick Ponce. J'aimerais poser la question à Alexandre. Plus I would like to ask si Alexandre a question, but I would like to ask the same questions to all of you. Uh, your company, can it be plus ou moins anti considered as a, a company? Uh, an, an, enter, uh, an enterprise like Melo or Quadrature of the Net uh, and all the, the other speakers. Could your company be considered as an anti GAFA um, company, uh, protection of the data and protection of uh, private life? We're not a company. We are not an enterprise. We are a community of people who are self-employers. And uh, yes, as a matter of fact, we try to find uh, more responsible models. And uh, it's true that it's uh, necessary to, to highlight what is not responsible in the GAFAs. But uh, we are cooperative platforms, and it means we have other people on other topics. 
Now, the uh, anti-GAFA league is an interesting player. They have good uh, roots, and on the, that basis, we maybe can develop a, another behavior. Well, I have just finished my mission on uh, the uh, digital society at the Ministry of Employment to see how we can emerge a new culture to uh, digital uh, well, environment for consumers and citizens to realize what is at stake and provide alternatives which are required or transformations uh, in front of those players. Uh, so it uh, goes uh, through alternatives and the education of citizens. <coughs> well, I'm not going to go in an anti-GAFA coalition. I, I am, have uh, links with committed uh, organizations. I have the feeling that we should have a part to play in awareness raising, for instance, uh, without uh, using all the data. But we can't say we are not uh, like those. You know, it's um, point to those people saying we are not certainly the same as they are. And I have something in mind. I, get, I got to that position saying the private data will not be used but the statistics may be good. Uh, retail, the retailers uh, can uh, put their stocks at the right place, for instance. Uh, uh, when you use the service, you receive the governance of that. You, if you sell it, how much will you sell it for? Uh, and why? To, what to do with it? Uh, so it's a project uh, which uh, is very, very uh, close to my heart, I would say. Uh, as I said with the store, it should be a starting point to think about these issues, generally speaking, and not only for share Atlan. Uh, same thing. We are not going to uh, get to a group, a denti gafa group. Our DNA is a consumption and benevolence and a wish to do things well. So that's why we have asked to have a B Corp label to uh, deal with uh, uh, protection of the data, good governance, etc. So we try to transmit that to our custom customers and consumers through our product, but I think that there are many things that should be told to people. People know nothing, and that's the stake today, the challenge today. We, data, data may be very useful to all of us. We have to understand that we are all in, we are all responsible for our uh, digital responsibility to use data as they should be. And I think that we have to educate consumers and consumers should know what it means to say yes when you are asked whether you accept the cookies, what does it really mean? They have to have the power to choose the type of information they are ready to share or not share, and they should know what the impact of purchasing on Amazon is, because today people know nothing. And I was really surprised this summer with people from Spain these were people uh, with a good education, uh, etc., uh, purchasing power, etc. And uh, when I said 
Well, when I was asked questions on Amazon, etc., people say, why do you say that, but Amazon is really practical, it's easy. Yes, it is, it is true. But then you say that uh, uh, you don't want uh, your data to be used, but you don't even know what uh, buying on Amazon is. There are real challenges in education, and, peop and uh, <coughs> there is a responsibility there propose uh, alternatives to GAFA. GAFA didn't exist 15 years ago. They've grown because they've uh, set up a proposal that uh, drew the interest of consumers, and now the ecosystem should propose alternative things that uh, will attract consumers, responsible, transparent for each consumer to know how he or she consumes and what he or she uh, shares with all the digital players. Yeah, so for Utopia, um, yeah, good. <laughs> for Utopia, that uh, has been an important thing since the beginning. Uh, in the user side, of course, we have all the normal regulations for keeping data. We do collect a lot of data for the, from the travelers and our proposal and our approach it's that we saw that one of the reasons why all these small initiatives are failing and are in a massive disadvantage against big platforms like Airbnb or Expedia is because they don't have access to this information that it's already there right? and it's already available for many people. So what we're proposing is that we're making on our own platform a way that different initiatives can share their insights and the data so they can improve in a collaborative way as a whole platform of a different kind of tourism that is gonna be available in Mexico and in Latin America. So in that sense, the way we wanna, we, we see it at least is we're trying to be very sensitive to data, but in the way that the people that can take advantage of that the most are these small initiatives and they can collaboratively grow together. Okay, well, um, we just have about 30 seconds left, so I'll, I'll answer quickly for B-Lab. Um, also for us, data is one of those things that we're very sensitive about in as much as we're not a sharing platform, but uh, we do have a lot of strict um, standards as it relates to how we use the information that we collect from companies, and that's why B Corps trust us um, with very sensitive information. Um, and, and I've, I've talked to investors who are like, hey, the, the, the idea of data mining, that's gold. Um, but we're very strict in how we use that gold. Um, we do not use it to benefit them. It's for the benefit of the companies. Um, and so with that, I want to thank you all. Our time is up. I want to thank you all for being a very engaging audience and for my panelists for being absolutely amazing. Thank you all so much. Oh. Et juste avant de partir, on va faire un petit and uh, be just before we leave here, the theme today is uh, Ego Imperium. I have the power to change the world. We all have the power to change the world. And uh, you probably heard that we have to take commitments. So to, what I propose is to do it with a paper or a screen. Turn to your neighbor and take two minutes to think together what engagement you can take for the world. You met, you will meet someone if you don't know your neighbor, and you will find another way to commit yourselves, and this uh, should be really positive. Let us start that, okay?